happy sabbath to all i'm sorry i'm a couple minutes uh, late but we are here and i praise god for the privilege of being here all right i hope everyone had a wonderful week we'll wait for a few minutes whisper a prayer in the morning whisper a prayer at noon Ooh. whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune god answers prayers in the morning god answers prayers at noon god answers prayers in the evening so keep your heart in tune well we We are waiting for a few minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Well, we'll begin. We are um, today. We'll we'll have a quick little prayer, Father God, as we come to you this morning. We praise you. We give you thanks. We give you honor, and we give you glory, Father. As we study your lesson this morning, I pray that you cover us under your wings. May you um, be with your children. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to watch over each and every one of us and help us to trust you. Father, um, help us to study your lesson, Lord, and to put it in application. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. Um, I want to say, again, good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I, if you can see me or um, if you can hear me. Because according to me, I see no one online. I don't know if um, my notifications are off or not. Okay. All right. So we'll begin. All right. We are on lesson five, and it is Noble Prince of Peace. Again, Noble Prince of Peace. Lesson five, our memory text this morning is, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we find that in Isaiah 9, verse 6. And the lesson goes on to, to tell us of a, of a story about Dr. Oppenheimer, who supervised the creation of the first atomic bomb, okay, appeared before a U.S. congressional committee. They asked him if there was any defense against this weapon. And uh, the great physicist answered, certainly there is. And that is? Uh, they looked, uh, you know, at him, and Dr. Oppenheimer looked over the audience and said softly, peace, peace is the weapon, it, you know, so if there's peace in this world, then there will be no use to use, um, you know, the, the atomic bombs or the weapons. And so peace is an elusive dream for the human race. Everybody wants peace. We want peace in our lives. We want peace with each other, we want peace um, you know, among nations. We want peace, 
and definitely that's a good thing to have peace um all right so it says uh you know the world has been entirely at peace only about eight percent of the time so if you think about that that is like wow only eight percent of the time during these years at least eight thousand treaties have been broken during the half century following the end of world war one which was supposed to be the war to end all wars right there were two minutes of peace for every year of war now in 1895 alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite right provided a trust to establish a prize for individuals who made an outstanding contribution to peace and we know that's what is called the Nobel Peace Prize, right? But it says even some winners of the Nobel Peace Prize have been involved in violent conflict. So this week we will be, uh, we will read about the only one who brings true everlasting peace. And you know who that is. This is my Jesus. Amen. Okay. On Sunday's lesson, it talks about the end of gloom for Galilee. And Isaiah 8, 21 and 22, verse 21 and 22, it describes the hopeless condition of those who turn to the occult rather than to the true God. Okay, you know what? I still don't see anybody online. I don't know if that is usual or what happened. Um... So I, I'm, I don't know, but I guess I will just keep going because uh, I can't see that any of you are online. Okay, Isaiah 8, 21 and 22 describes the hopeless condition of those who turn to the occult rather than to the true God. Wherever they look, they will see only distress and darkness the gloom of anguish and they will be thrust into thick darkness okay so what was happening to the children of israel remember they were um worshiping other gods they went deeply into the occult where they turned away from god and they were uh you know like going from dark to darkest they were like just plunging uh you know into darkness with their um worship to to the occult to the devil and so um, you know, it's their condition was almost hopeless and, um, and they needed to turn to the true God, but they, you know, they didn't because, you know, be, with, with so much practice of it, they were just, they kept going down the wrong spiral. And by contract, there will come a time when there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. That's Isaiah nine verse one. So now, um, you know, God sends hope and it says, you know, the people of the Galilee region are singled out here as receiving the special blessing of a great light. And Isaiah 9, 2, it says, The nation will be multiplied and rejoice because God will have broken the rod of their oppressors. Amen. Found in Isaiah 9, verse 4. It says, um, the region, I want to read this note to you. It says, the region of Lake Galilee is depicted here because it was among the first territories of Israel to be conquered in response to Ahaz's request for aid from Tiglath Pileser III. Okay, he took the, the Galilee and Transjordanian regions of northern Israel, carried some of the people captive, and turned the territories into Assyrian provinces. So Isaiah's message is that the first to be conquered would be the first to see deliverance. Amen. And it says, whom does God use to deliver his people? Wow. Isaiah 9 verse 6 and 7. It tells us someone called wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And we know who that is, who the description is describing. And that is Jesus amen and it says that um and how when and how was the prophecy of isaiah 9 1 to 5 fulfilled we see that in matthew 
4 verse 12 to 25. And it says it's when Jean Baptiste, okay, John the Baptist, was in prison. And Jesus left and went to Nazareth. And so this is when that, uh, you know, part of the prophecy was accomplished. It says, not by accident, Jesus' early ministry was in the Galilee region where he gave hope by announcing the good news of God's kingdom and by healing people, including delivering those that were possessed by evil spirits, delivering demoniacs from bondage to the occult. So remember, the only person that can save and, and deliver us from devil worshiping and from the occult is Jesus Christ himself, you know, the, the Prince of Peace, the mighty God. You know, he's the one who can do it. And so whatever is enchaining you in your life today, the only person that can really, um, you know, free you or grant you the freedom as, um, you know, the, as promised is Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. The Lord, right, makes images from one area uh, with those of another, such as in Matthew 24, when Jesus mingled the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 with the destruction at the end of the world. Right. If someone were to ask you, this is a question you need to answer. If someone were to ask you, what has Jesus delivered you from? What would you answer? Has Jesus done anything for you at all? What personal testimony can you give regarding the power of Christ in your life? Amen. So we see that, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, definitely has the power to deliver you and me. And, uh, you know, he wants to give us a personal testimony. And I know he has given me a lot of testimonies. And I know he has done the same for you. If you would only take the time to think back how Jesus has delivered you, has God has delivered you, yes, God has done a lot for you and me. All right. On Monday's lesson, it says, a child for us. Um, it talks about um, Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, uh, notice that the deliverer has several names epithets that describe him in various ways and the ancient near east right kings and deities had multiple names to show how great they were and so he is wonderful just as the divine angel of the lord described his own name to samson's father remember uh you know samson uh in the bible and judges you know, God came, you know, an angel, it says an angel came and told him about what his wife was going to, you know, to carry, uh, you know, that a special child, right? And so uh, the same, you know, so uh, Samson's father, um, he described himself as wonderful, right? The angel described himself as wonderful. And we know, uh, you know, in Isaiah, it talks about wonderful, also, you know, th that was, that's one of the names. And then he ascended toward heaven in the sacrificial flame on Manoah's altar. So while um, Samson's father, Manoah, was offering, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, was built an altar and was offering a sacrifice, and then the angel dropped in the middle and then, you know, just went up, which has several significance, right? Um, sig uh, it, it showed that, um, you know, thereby pre prefiguring his offering of himself more than 1,000 years later. So it was assembled. Then when Manoah and his wife saw what happened, they said, oh, my God, we are going to die. So they dropped down on their faces and said, we just saw the Lord. And, you know, it says that no one sees him and lives. But I realize in the Bible, God had a few exceptions about that suddenly with with Moses and Manoah and um, you know Abraham you know they did see the Lord um, but they lived so you know God is awesome he is referred to as divine mighty God and the eternal creator everlasting father right um, Adam said uh, you know son of God he is a king of the dynasty of David his kingdom of peace will be eternal. Amen. Amen. Only one reason fits 
uh, only one person fits Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God and Creator. Um, and that's found in John 1, verse 1, uh, 1, 2, 3. Who was born to us in order to save us and give us peace. Amen. He has received all authority in heaven and on earth, and he is with us always. You know, that is one promise as, you know, as, as, uh, you know, as I go through my life or I go through my day and I'm having like a rough day or whatever day I'm having, you know, Jesus promises us in his word that I am with you always, even unto the end. So I don't care what you're going through. Don't worry. God is with you and he is right there to protect you and watch over you. You don't need to worry about anything because God has you. God has your back. And it says, while retaining his divinity, he also has become human for all time. Ever able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Unto us, a child is born forever. Satan was on the ground and disputed every inch of advance in his path from the manger to Calvary. And that's what the devil always wants to do. He wants to get in and, you know, and just, you know, erase the thought of Jesus in our minds. He's constantly trying to put doubt in, in our minds that God really exists and that he really loves us. But yes, he does. Okay. And, um, Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of the angels, right? When he knew nothing of what it meant himself and when he would not himself make any self-sacrifice for others. Do you realize that people that are selfish are always accusing others of being selfish? Or somebody that is very prideful is constantly accusing others of being prideful. So, you know, this was Satan's condition and of trying to accuse God. And um, this, was, this was the accusation that Satan made against God and heaven. Okay, but it says Christ came to the world to meet these false accusations and to reveal the Father. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, the rod of God's anger. And sometimes, you know, uh, I know in life sometimes they say, oh, God doesn't get angry. God is love. But God is also a God of vengeance. He is a mighty warrior, uh, you know, and slow to anger. But sometimes we do so much to God that he does get angry. Uh, but, you know, even in his anger, he is merciful and he loves you and me. And it says, um, this section explains Isaiah 9, 1 to 5, which predicts deliverance for the gloomy, anguished people who have trusted in the occult and falling prey to military conquest and oppression. Do you realize that when we get away from God and, you know, we are doing our own thing, uh, you know, we usually fall into some kind of trouble or issues. And, um, you know, and the children of Israel this time fell into military conquest and oppression. The rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. So what I realize is, you know, the spirit of God, just like I remember in the, uh, the children of Israel, when they were in the desert and they were complaining and, oh, they were just giving God, you know, a hard time and Moses a hard time. And as they complain, God says, who has taken care of you all these years in the desert? You, your, your shoes have not been worn. Your clothes, it's still like they were brand new. So everything you have is, you know, is right there wonderful. And then he says, I'm the one who protected you from all these, from all these animals in the desert. And what happens? God took his protection away for just a little bit. And all these serpents, these, uh, you know, these very venomous serpents came and started biting the children of Israel and they started dying. So guys, when God takes his protection away from us, we become really vulnerable the only reason that you and I are there or we have not died in an accident or our enemies haven't gotten us, it's only because of God's protection. And so this is what happened. The God removed his protection from the children of Israel and the enemy came and took them and oppressed them. It says, um, in Tuesdays, through the suffering of God's people are shown in the above text, right? Um, we have the curses in Leviticus 26 verses 14 to 39 and then we will see the curses again and and deuteronomy 28 one of the things it says is 
Um, you know, the only reason God tell, told the children of Israel, and he's telling us today, turn away from your wicked way. That's what he wants us. And he's giving us warning. He says, follow my commandments. And this is why, guys, you know, I try. I said, Lord, write your words in my heart that I might not sin against you. Because only God can do something for you and I. Because we really can't do anything for ourselves. But, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So this is why when God gives us his ten commandments, he says, follow my commandments. If you don't, this is what I will do. And he kept warning them. Uh, warning them and guess what he did it and stages he didn't you know put all his wrath all at once he says if you don't do this this will happen if you don't do this this will happen so he kept telling them about the consequences if they don't follow him but they did not take God seriously and so oh my gosh and we you know sometimes we criticize the children of Israel and we say well I would have done different really no, you wouldn't. When you think about it, when I think about it, we are still acting in a wicked way. We are wicked people, and only through the blood of Jesus, and you know, can you and I be better, and you know, and try to be better Christians. But you know, we have to really try to follow His commands, and um, and ask Him to write His words in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. Okay, and it says that. Um, when they one of the things okay it says if god had wanted to destroy his people right he could have given them up to the assyrians right away but he is patient oh my god god is a god that is so patient right not wanting any to perish but all to come to repentance so this is god's only uh goal for you and i to repent from our sins and to come to him for us to have a repentant heart it says, when they persisted in evil and hardened their hearts against him and the appeal um, he, he sent through his messengers, he further withdrew his protection, but they continued to rebel. This cycle was repeated in a downward spiral until there was nothing more God could do. And so the children of Israel were taken into captivity and a whole bunch of bad things happened to them. And so it's the same thing for you and I today. What are we doing? You know, we need to really um, ask God to come into our lives and to try and, and repent and say, Lord, I can't do it on my own, but I can do all things through you who gives me strength, Lord. And so this is what we need to really ask God and, and to, you know, for him to come and, and be with us. Now, uh, you know, and Isaiah 9 verse 17 says, everyone is a, you know, it says, what sins, I, I want you to, um, to get this question. It says, what sins are the people guilty of? And that's found in Isaiah 9, 8 to 10, 10 um, to Isaiah 9 verse 8 to Isaiah 10 verse 2. It said, what sins are the people guilty of against whom have they committed them? Who is guilty among them? Now. Uh, the Bible says, like in 9 verse 17, it says, Everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer. Their mouth speaks folly. So not just one, not just two, but everyone. So we all, uh, and this is why, you know, when I see people like, you know, acting all high and mighty, I am so perfect, I am, you know, a child of God, and I sin not. What does the Bible says? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Wow, yes, we have. So we all have fallen short. So I want you guys to understand that. That, you know, uh, you know, we all are hypocrites. We all are, are sinners that are trying. And so God made humans free. He had to, other, you know, he had to. Otherwise, we could never truly love him. And freedom involves the option to do wrong. So God has created us with free will. You know, and that's why he says, choose you today whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. And I want my children to serve the Lord. I grew, grew them up showing them the way. Now, right now, my children have the free will. They're, you know, all my kids are, my youngest is 21. He's going to be 22. So there's no way I can force him. I only can show him the way. This is the way that you should go. But guess what? If he chooses to follow his friends and 
you know, he has the free will to choose God because God is not the God of his mom or of his dad. It, he, we each, every child, every person needs to take God as your personal savior. We cannot look at our neighbor and said, look, look at them. They're, they're doing this. Why can't I do it too? They're doing drugs. They're drinking. They're doing this. Are they our model? No, they're not. And if, you know, even if you see me and I am, you know, right here telling you, you know, just, oh, praise the Lord. And then in the back, I am doing what is not right with God. Should you follow Sister Junon? No, you should not. You know, do what Sister Junon says to do, not what um, she is doing. What does the Bible says? Keep your eyes focused on God and God alone. So, and this is what this, this whole thing is talking about. You need to choose God for yourself. You have the free will. What are you going to do? What are you going to choose? Is because your friends don't go to church or they don't talk about God. Does that mean you need to follow them? No, God is a God of individuals. He wants, he gives you the free will to do what you will do. Okay, he says, he also will allow us to face the fruit of our wrong decision, pain, suffering, fear, turmoil, and so forth, all in order to help us realize just what turning away from him leads to. When we turn away from God, oh my God, you know, we can be, um, imagine you are with the Lord and you are trying to do his will and still you get temptation chin so bad that sometimes you're almost falling and uh, imagine when you do get away from the lord and you don't want to follow him what happens then wow it's you know i i'm scared just to even think about it that's why i said lord please keep me under your wings i want to remain in god's presence at all time i want to remain in his will i want to spend time with my god right um, and so, you know, we need to really think about that, that, you know, today, who will you serve? If your parents are doing wrong, are you going to follow them? You know, you need to follow God. Okay. Um, and yet, even though how often these things don't make people put away sin and come to the Lord, sometimes, you know, fear, anguish, all of that, it still doesn't make us want to come to God. Why? Because we want to do our own thing. And so today I, you know, I am, I'm like, Guys, choose today to do right with the Lord and to have him as your personal Savior. Um, on Wednesday, Wednesday, it says root and branch and one, right? It talks about in Isaiah 11, verse 1, it says, picks up the imagery of a felled tree, okay? That's found in Isaiah 10, 33, and 34. The stump of Jesse represents the idea that the dynasty, excuse me, my allergies are acting up. I'm sorry. Um, you know, the stump of Jesse represents the idea that the dynasty of David, son of Jesse, would lose its power, right? And it says, but there would arise a shoot branch from the apparently doomed stump that is a ruler descended from David. Yes, you know, this was such a beautiful you know, analogy, it's like, you know, uh, the house of David has fallen, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, the house, the stump of Jesse, which was David's dad, it has fallen, but guess what? Out of it shoots a branch. You know, have you ever seen like, you know, a tree in the forest or maybe by your house, you know, that was cut down and, you know, it's like they left it for dead and then out of nowhere, you see a little branch sprouting up and it's so beautiful and it's like wow i thought this was dead but you know when god is the one that gives life he does whatever he wants and so this is exactly you know what what happened what happened there um okay where um i want to make sure that we're done on time okay and it says the description fits only jesus right um, you know, when it talks about, but there would arise a shoot branch from the apparently doomed stump that is a ruler descended from David. And we know who that is. That was Jesus Christ. And the description fits only Jesus Christ, who is both the root and the descendant of David. Amen. Christ came from the line of David, who was descended from Adam, who was the son of God. Christ was David's ancestor. 
as well as his descendant. Amen. Um, in what ways does the new Davidic ruler reverse the evil effects of sin and apostasy? Um, that's found in Isaiah 11. It says, he thinks and acts in harmony with the Lord, judges fairly, punishes the wicked, and brings peace. Amen. When he takes over, the Lord will bring back, restore, and unite a faithful remnant of Israel and Judah. Praise God for that. And Isaiah 11, both comings of Jesus are presented as one picture. They are tied together because they are two parts of a whole, like the two sides of a flat plane, right? Two sides, but one, the plan of salvation to be completed requires both comings. The first, which already has happened, and the second, which we await as the consummation of all our hopes as Christians. Amen. And, uh, you know, Thursday, lesson you comforted me and isaiah 12 verse 2 it says comes comes close to identifying the coming deliverer as jesus it says that god is my salvation and he has become my salvation amen the name jesus the lord is salvation amen wow it says that god is my salvation and he has become my salvation. The name Jesus means the Lord is salvation. So, you know, when people tell me, oh, don't say the name Jesus, all I know is that there is power in the name of Jesus. And I'm not saying Jesus for anybody, but this is what I see and hear, uh, you know, in the Bible. And what does Jesus mean? The Lord is salvation. Uh, hallelujah. It says, not only... Okay, does the Lord bestow salvation, but he himself also is salvation. The presence of the Holy One of Israel in our midst. God is with us. Not only did Jesus do miracles, but he also became flesh and lived among us. Amen. When he is lifted up on the cross, he draws all people to himself. Hallelujah. A remnant shall return to the mighty God, who is the child born for us, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Now, it says, and it is through God's grace and mercy that we can have an eternal share in that redemption as well. In other words, that redemption that was in him can become ours by faith and not by works. Because no works we do are good enough to redeem us. Amen. And I hope you know that. There is nothing you can do to redeem yourself. Only Jesus can do it by grace. Only by his grace. Only the works that Christ did, which he credits to us by faith, can bring redemption. How does this truth give you hope and assurance of salvation? Especially when you feel overwhelmed by your own sense of unworthiness. So guys, as we go through life, I want you guys to really think about think about it. Jesus as your redeemer, as your savior, as your prince of peace. Jesus wants pe to put peace in our lives. Can you imagine still being in the storm but having peace? That's how I usually my life is very stormy and I feel peace in the middle of my storm. And people say, well, how can Junon, with so much that you're going through, how can you go to bed and sleep? Guess what? My husband always complains be because when I go to bed, as I'm laying, as I'm going like this to hit the pillow, I'm already gone. Why? Because I give all my issues to God. I say, Lord, this is, you know, I, I need to go to bed because I have to wake up in the morning and start all over again. So you deal with this, you deal with my issues, you deal with my problems as I'm, I'm giving them all to God and I'm going to sleep. And so I praise God that he has given me sleep and peace in the middle of my storm. Why? Because God is in control of my storm and he is in control of your storm. So you can be peaceful and know that God has your back and you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to 
be like, oh my God, you know, I, I, I can't sleep. I, you know, I ha I'm having issues. God is in control, guys. Just give it to him in prayer. And he is going to take it and he is going to solve it. And he is going to give you his peace. Amen. Anyway, to finish, it said, um, you know, Christ was the one who consented to meet the conditions necessary for man's salvation. No angel, no man was sufficient for the great work to be wrought. The Son of Man alone must be lifted up, for only an infinite nature could undertake the redemptive process. Christ consented to connect himself with the disloyal and sinful, to partake of the nature of man, to give his own blood, and to make his soul an offering for sin. Amen, amen, amen. So, um, you know, the summary is, uh, end the days of Isaiah, which means, whose name, Isaiah means salvation of the Lord. That's what the word Isaiah means, amen. Just like, um, you know, so we need to, to know that. God promised his remnant people salvation from the oppression that was coming upon them as a result of national apostasy. This prophecy of hope finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus whose name means the Lord is salvation what does the word Jesus mean the Lord is salvation so I want you to take that name to the bank and that's why there is power in the name of Jesus you know when when you are tr in trouble when you when you you know when your heart is troubled just call on the name of Jesus what a wonderful name the one what you know his name is wonderful counselor Prince of Peace, you know, a mighty God. This is this is who you and I are dealing with. This is our Savior. And so his name, Jesus, means the Lord is salvation. So do not fear. Do not fret. God is with you. And just turn from your wicked ways. Just turn and repent, and God will be with you. So as we end today, I hope that, uh, you know, this brings you peace. You know, uh, you don't need to win a Nobel Peace Prize. You can win one from God, from Jesus. All of us are candidates for a Nobel Peace Prize from the Lord. Amen. And, uh, you know, we don't have to do anything extraordinary except repent from our sins and accept him as our personal Savior. So as I end today, I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day. And may God be with you and watch over you and protect you. And may he give you his peace. Father God, I thank you and praise you for who you are. I pray, Lord, that you continue to cover each and every one of us. Bless each person watching, Lord. I thank you and praise you, Father. I, I don't know what happened to the feed, Lord, but I know you've got that under control. Each person that is watching now or later, may you cover them. May you give them your peace, Lord. And may they take your name, that means the Lord is salvation, seriously, Lord that they know they can count on you and they can trust you. We thank you and praise you, Lord. Help us to have a wonderful Sabbath and a great week and to come back here next week, Lord, to give you more praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, may God be with you. Bye-bye.